gonna spend a lot of time on this. Want to make sure that we're on the same page of the hymnal. I am going to draw your attention, please, to the T drive. The T for junk drive, right here. LIB 106. And in addition to my self-portrait, you will notice, and you've been here before, that there should be, there is a Blocks DFT24 folder. And there is, uh, Drafting Student CD. Please go to the Drafting Student CD. Go to the very first folder, which is Architectural Blocks and Symbols. And in the Architectural Blocks and Symbols, you'll notice the third choice down is Electrical Plan. And there are three drawing files there. I'm just going to grab each one in succession here. The first one I'm going to open is Electrical Notes. And you don't see anything on the screen. If you click on one of the notes, you click on all the notes, you'll find that the electrical layer is set up currently as kind of a dark gray color. Just change that to white, please. And you'll notice that we have full-on electrical notes. And here's what I want you to do with this electrical notes file. I would fully expect that on your electrical plan, you would be creating a layer that is going to allow you to do notes, symbols, wiring, etc. I want you to use this notes sheet as your checklist. So, for each of the items that you see, what I would expect is that you would be following what each of these is enumerating. All kitchen plugs, light fixtures, GFI, okay? All garage exterior plugs and light fixtures on GFI. What's a GFI? That's a ground fault interrupter. So, you are going to show a ground fault interrupter, a GFI or GFCI, receptacle in at least one location on your plan. Okay? And your circuit, if you will, your spline with the wire that's attached to it is going to connect every outlet vis-a-vis -vis plug okay, in the exterior garage and kitchens that are going to require GFI. Okay? I'm sorry, Didi. Yes. I think there's a note actually further down on restrooms. Number three, provide a separate circuit for microwave. Okay. Well, okay. What's a circuit? You're providing a receptacle. Receptacle is going to be proximal to the cabinet where the cabinet is expecting the microwave to be. Okay. Separate circuit for personal computing. Verify location with owner. That, kind of was a classic a few years ago when it came down to all these computers, these new fancy fangled things required more power than they do now. Now we pretty much don't require any kind of dedicated power for a computer. But what I'd like to have you do is use this as your tool and your guideline to make sure that you're doing and completing your electrical plan as expected. Okay? So that's the first item I want to show you. Then we'll talk about the details of how we want this drawn. And so my expectation is that you would, you would take this electrical note mm -hmm. 
select all of it, do a control C, and only because I don't at the moment have my house plan up, but if I did and it was off in my model space, I could control V and bring my notes in on my electrical sheet. Okay. Secondly, we'll go to electrical symbol master. Same issue here. This particular layer was done in kind of, I don't know, dark gray, purple, whatever the heck color it is. And that probably happened as a result of whoever was last using this file. They just did a poor job of lifting it or they saved it. All right. But here are your, or at least a partial grouping of blocks that you are welcome to use. Rather than recreating them, you may use yours from Drafting 12 as well or you can use what's provided here. And lastly, we have the electrical symbols file. And if you notice, this is more of a legend, not the actual block itself. However, you can grab information and copy it accordingly. Now I'm going to pick on Didi for just a minute because for those of you who have not met Didi Rohr, she's been sitting in here quietly with her young grandchild who's about to enter college. And Didi teaches Drafting 12 for us. Okay? She is a professional drafter. She works in the field every single day. Your job, Didi, if you were to describe it in a couple of sentences, would be what? And who do you work for? Uh, well, I work for uh, voltage uh, specialist fire alarm systems up in Paradise. Mm -hmm. And um, well, for, I know you asked for just a couple of questions. No, no, that's okay. Take as much as you like. He employed me on the side while I was working another job and finally had uh, need of somebody in his office five days a week, half day. So offered that position to me, and I've been there for a little over two years, about two and a half years now. But uh, I worked for him for about four and a half years on the side, but pretty steady, about eight months. Um, and it's, it's low voltage stuff. It's not any high voltage, uh, but I'm getting quite, a, quite an education on uh, not only how the fire alarm systems are put together and what each of the uh, symbols represents, but um, uh, reading the plans is mm -hmm. uh, a huge part, not only the plans that come to us from the architect and engineers, but uh, the plans that have been marked up or called grid lines. Uh, I take corrections from my boss or his technicians and make corrections on the plans as we get ready to finalize the job and uh, provide the drawing of record. What does that mean? That is the final drawing of what exactly is in the building and where it's located, how the wiring is um, situated between devices and the fire alarm panel. Nice. And it shows the quantities that are there, um, every single device, uh, what type of wiring, there's different types of wires, um, and there's also, for instance, if you look in, well, let's see, are there any in this room? <laughs> yeah, back here by the door, uh, there is a red box, that's a, a pole station, a pole station. Yep. and uh, there should be at least one horn strobe in here, oh, back there here above the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that we may have installed these because we do a lot of work with Butte College. But um, it's all fire life and safety, and we want to make sure that students, and we do a lot with uh, Enlo and Feather River Hospitals. Um,
but uh, we want to make sure that everybody is safe and secure if there's a fire. So on the, on the drafting side specifically, uh, when you say you're providing a drawing of record, when you're doing a lot of this, uh, what, and for, forgive my use of vernacular, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the single line or the schematic type that are depicting symbols of strobes or pull stations or control boxes or whatnot. Smoke alarms. Everything seems to refer back to some form of a legend. Yes, yes absolutely. Okay. So that's the legend is going to show not only the symbol of what each device is, but it also shows how many there are. What the, for instance, on the smoke on the um, horn strobes and strobes, it would show it the specific candela that is programmed for that device, which is um, in sound you have decibels, in uh, light you have um, candela. So the intensity in light. And uh, for a room this size, it's probably going to be a 75 candela. Um, the main uh, lobby out here would probably be 110. A restroom is only 15. And the idea behind that is that you need to have enough candela to overcome the ambient light that's in the room and get people's attention. Right, and if there's a power outage, uh -huh. these things are backed up by battery. So the panel has a battery on it so that everything can still function properly for, I think, a couple of hours. Um, but the... Um, so do you have a pretty extensive symbol library that you work with yourself? Pretty extensive, yeah. Uh, we have the general things that we deal with smoke detectors, heat detectors, there's different forms, different types. We've got smoke duct detectors for the air conditioning H HVAC. Um, uh, a couple of different horn strobes and strobes or ceiling mounted, wall mounted, mm -hmm. indoor, outdoor. Um, I would say I'm probably on a daily basis, I'm probably dealing with uh, not really very many on the daily basis that I use on each plan, maybe 15 to 20 different devices. Gotcha. And would, would even though the, the condition of the type of electrical devices that you see here would be different than global, if, is this kind yes. of typical of what the way you might see it in a legend? Um, I have mine actually set up um, in kind of a grid box, oh. so it's, it's um, all outlined and there's lines in between each column and each row mm -hmm. so that it's very um, obvious what goes with what and that the, I'm not knocking what you've got here oh, no, but, no. but for instance your GFI line um, if you had a line between that it would definitely separate the two the GFI and the can light uh, makes it a little easier to read so would you also have kind of a standard set of notes that would go and accompany with each drawing? We do. Okay. And we have to update those uh, from time to time. For instance, if uh, NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, I believe it is, uh, when they update their records, we have to update the dates on our uh, notes so that it's, is it 2013 or is it going to be 2014 version? Gotcha. But yeah, we have a, a general set of notes. Then we also have a monitoring note that shows the, the monitoring company. And um, we're also now including the account number for oh. that particular customer okay. client. So last question for you, and that would be more on line types, types of activities that you would see. Your schem schematic, meaning the wire that may exist or the circuit completion that exists between the enunciator and the pull handle or between a control panel and a device, is that typically done in a spline condition or are you no. doing it in a routed condition where you're doing them as lines? Uh, if it was my preference, it would be a curved line, uh -huh. but I'm going by what the boss wants and it is a straight line, but I do fill it with a radius when there's a turn. Uh, so it's not going from fixture directly to another fixture. It's following a straight and, uh, you know, a vertical or horizontal path in most cases. Okay. 
and we also um, use a solid, a uh, continuous line type, but it's a heavier uh, line weight. So if we're using green, it's a little bit heavier than red, and um, that's how it's more visible on the printed drawing. Gotcha. So a lot of kind of enunciating the, the type of circuit that it is by color and by line weight. Yes. Right. Even though it's a black and white drawing, when it's printed. When it's printed. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So, not too far off the mark with certainly with what we have here. Different application with the high voltage here being, you know, house electricity distribution, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I think it's plain to see from Dee's perspective, and thank you very much for letting me put you on the spot. You're it's welcome. Good timing. That we we do a lot of things, particularly in this industry that are the same as the last time but a little bit different this time and so we keep that library fresh as much as possible whether it's an agency change or whether it's a particular customer number serial number whatever it is a monitor number but in our case we're not going to do this over and over again it's you know, back to why we create blocks to begin with and why we create these notes so these are things that would typically be taken from a symbol library of some type, excerpted from their location by copying, and then they would be placed in the specific drawing that you have. All right. So, electrical notes, this electrical master, and your ultimately your blocks and symbols. All right. So. In our case now, we would like to complete this circuit that we're, that we're creating in our plan. And I'm just going to create a 110 volt recept convenience receptacle to a switch. Okay. Oh, one more question, Didi. Sorry again to put you on the spot, but are does your industry rely on the installer being aware and responsible for correct fastening of wires and connections and that kind of thing? Absolutely. They have to follow some some code yes. authority. Yes. That's NFPA. That's part of the NFPA. Yes. Okay. All right. So with electrical planning, it's a little bit different than what we've uh, encountered so far with architecture, where the architect may be calling the shot with respect to what they'd like to see, but how that gets implied in the home, that's going to be the responsibility of the electrical contractor. Low volt, high volt, doesn't really matter. Same thing with plumbing, okay? That the, uh, the expectation is, is that the trade manages to the standard and the regulation that's created, and they're trained to that, okay? Oftentimes, the tradespeople, are go, they go through an apprenticeship program, they go through to a journey level, and then they're qualified, fully qualified, to be able to do the installs. Okay. All right. So our job is to schematically show what it is that we would like to have, and then we rely upon the trade to assure that it's done correctly. Okay. So I'm going to grab this convenience outlet, and at the moment, it's just a symbol. And I'm going to control C it by copy. And I'm going to go back to my very simplistic house plan here. And I'll control V. It's now placed on my cursor. And as you can see at the moment, you notice that my snap is such that my endpoint is going to be the definitive snap location. If I click this right now, what's going to happen? Where is it going to go? Okay. In in other words, that if that is turned so that that snap configuration is shown, it's always going to snap to the corner. And because it's not a block, each of these drawing entities is going to come off individually. Once I have it placed, if I need to place it in a slightly different location, then I can use the move command. 
specify a base point. I'll use the end point of that line. And then I can move it along that wall, a point of intersection, either direction. And notice how it, as I bring it closer, there's kind of that magnetic attraction that it snaps in place at that point of intersection. I know, me too. All right, now I have a switch. And notice that I have a switch in this particular symbol library that is turned on its side or straight up and down. I also have some that are superscripted with a three-way configuration. And then the various different types of high volt and low volt symbols that would be used. So I'm just going to grab this switch. Again, I'm going to control C. And I will control V. Whoops. What did I do? Grab two things at the same time. Escape out of that. Back to my symbols. Only my switch. Again, if I go ahead and use my snap in its current configuration, where is it going to go? It's going to go to that corner. And in the case where I know I'm going to most, most likely rotate, then I'm just going to place it at some place convenient for me, and then I'll do my rotation. Go ahead and do a snap, rotate it. I'm rotating it to an angle of 270 degrees, meaning I'm coming from 0, 90, 180, 270, and rotating it. Now I can do a move, select the object, enter. My base point, I'm going to grab an end point, some place that's convenient for me to actually work. And I'm going to place this switch Again, no matter what I do, that's where it's going to be placed. So one way to avoid that would be what? Excellent, Jim. Thank you very much. Okay, there's an inherent problem with that, though, and that is if I undo them all or, or turn them all off, what's going to happen? I'm probably going to be unable to assure that I've got a snap to a wall. I'm going to end up with an overlap or a gap. Good practice says we really don't want to see that happen. So I'm actually going to make sure that my settings, I don't have much turned on, but in this case I am going to turn on intersection and off endpoint. Select it again, remove. And you notice now there's nothing I can grab. That's right. So what would have been a better choice for me to make than the choice I made just by turning things off? This goes back to drafting 12. I turned on my menu bars. I went, I'm going to, I should say, tools, toolbars, AutoCAD, and object snap. Remember, it's most likely on my separate monitor, so I'm going to drag it back to my graphics area and dock it to the left-hand side if, or right-hand, depending on what I'd like to do. The point is, is that object snap toolbar is actually something you should continue to use. It's not just a learning tool that we turn on and then turn off when you guys are all good at using the snap uh, ready bar at the bottom. In this case, I'm probably going to turn that off like Jim recommended, and then I'm going to go strictly with snaps. Okay. So 
So I'll, again, I'll select everything. I'll do a control C. And I'm going to snap to endpoint. Okay, either way. Control C. Snap to endpoint. It doesn't like it, does it? We'll go with the move. Select, enter. Now I'll snap to endpoint. There it is. Now it's hanging on my cursor. And if I use my snap tool again to snap to an intersection, you notice I can place it anywhere along that wall that I so desire. Now if I had a door opening here, it probably would be a little bit more realistic to show. But in my case, I'm going to snap. And there's my receptacle. Now I've got to account for my wire to a fixture. So I've got a switch, I've got a receptacle. I don't need to close the circuit between these two even if it's a switched outlet. But I'm going to put a fan in the center of the room. Or an overhead light. I guess I'll grab the overhead light. It's convenient for me. Again, control C. Back to my garage plan. Control V. And there's my symbol. Now I would like to place a circuit to complete between the switch and the light fixture. You notice I have an electrical layer and then I have a wire layer. So I'm going to go to my wire layer and make that current. Notice that it is set to a line type of hidden 2. I use the red object filter, but there's my all used layers and there's my wire. Now if I click on line, Still need to go back now to my snap, endpoint, snap to endpoint, and I have a very nice red wire, which is not going to work very well for our purposes, so I'm going to change that to yellow. That's not a willy-nilly change, that's just for clarity on the board. But this is not a preferred way. Now, even Didi mentioned that they use straight lines for circuits, but they also use a form of a fillet. And they give some definition to their line type as designated, uh, designating a circuit or a circuit type. In our case, we're going to avoid using any straight lines at all. And we're going to grab a polyline in the form of a spline. Now, a spline is a polyline. It's a special kind of polyline that allows us now to put and place a curve If only I can get my demo to work. Huh? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll do a spline again, endpoint. Grab my second endpoint.
Notice because I grabbed the wrong type of snap coordinate, it's going to give me an invalid. Oh, third time's the charm. Endpoint. Now when I click on it, you notice that it is definitely connected to that endpoint. I need to use the enter command to now signify that I'm done with the work. Now if I don't like the way that that's come out, I can click on the spline and I can move it out of the way. So think about how busy your floor plans get with notes and information. If you use the spline tool, it gives us a certain amount of freedom to be able to move things away from obscuring a particular note or piece of information. Okay. Absolutely. The nice thing about spline as well is you have more curvability the more times you click. So it gives you more um, ability to move it around, like John was saying, to avoid uh, information that might be in that area. You just repeat the clicking. And then just keep clicking as you're drawing it. So Tim, I'm going to do that right now. I'm just going to start at the same point that I did before, but Didi's absolutely 100% right. I'm going to go click, 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 click. And now I'm going to grab the endpoint and hit enter. Now if I click on this spline, you can see I have one place to grab. But if I click on the spline, because I created so many other nodes, I have much more control. Actually, some go to probably three or four now. Yes, because we have some really large structures, like the Butte College jobs that we do, and the Feather River Hospital, Manuel Hospital. We have tons of pages. Well, I, I mean, for those. it wouldn't be tied in on the same page as the electrical. Oh no. No. No, no, typically it would. You're, you're right, Jim. It would have its own area of the uh, of the electrical section. Each contractor would have their own section. Like mm -hmm. our sheets are FA pages, and then electrical might be E pages, E sheets, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all righty. Wow, you can see these guys don't get out much. <laughs> Slow down, fellas. You'll go faster. I, I didn't see Jim at all. I need a good light. <laughs> all right. You, you were saying with the notes, though, I mean, we got different layers. So is it that critical? Like, you, know, you turn on electrical and you can make your notes over here? Or is that going to be an issue? Loading all the, you know, you got electrical notes, foundation notes, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So, so there is, there are, let's talk about room labels as an example, okay? I'm probably going to continue to have room labels even if it's just an electrical plant, okay. all right? So family room, bedroom, bedroom one, master bedroom, what have you, I'm probably going to leave the, those tags or those pieces of text turned on. I probably want to take my circuit and avoid obscuring or worse, have the lettering obscure the wire, okay? On an electrical plan, the wire is going to take precedence over the label. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Because you want to know yep. what room you're putting your electrical in. Exactly. Okay. Something else I wanted to make note of, and I think we I think we talked about this already. Did we talk about dashed lines and hidden lines? And the thickness across? I might have talked about drafting drafting twelve. But you notice now. I have a certain distance that exists between the actual dash and the space in between the dashes. Okay? There's a standard for that, believe it or not. Okay? ANSI has a standard for how much distance has to go 
for the dash and the space in between. And back in the day when we did hand drafting, we needed to account for that. But with CAD, we let the computer do the work. But I want to draw your attention to something, and this might be something that is going to be effective for you in line types. Right now we have the line loaded as a hidden line type. I'm going to go to Format, Line Type. And you notice I have a hidden hit, hit, and hidden to line type. And I'm going to load a new line type. And I'm going to load hidden. And I'm going to load hidden x2. I'm just going to use my control key to grab both of them and click. So now I have a hidden, a hidden 2, and a hidden x2. So the hidden follows the standard. The correct amount of space in between the dashes and the dashes themselves. Hidden 2 takes the information and now reduces it to half. In other words, half the dash, half the space. Hidden x2 doubles the dash and doubles the space in between. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to click on my wire layer in my layer properties. And I'm going to change to hidden x2 and click OK. And if you can watch over here to the right, you can actually see what will happen to the line type. Okay, so the space in between the dashes is now twice the size that it was before. Pardon me, it was set to hidden too, so it's actually four times the width that it was before. And I will change the line type again from the hidden x2 to hidden. And click OK. I'm going to, just to illustrate the point that I'm trying to make here, I'm going to create another layer and I'm going to call it wire 1. And this line type is going to be hidden x2. And I'm going to make this one, the spline that I made to the left, the hidden x2, but I'm going to just move it to the wire layer. So, sorry, Tyler, I missed that. So yes, sir. Uh, meaning geographic location around? So like Just because you saw it in the plan set that we gave you does not make it right. right. Okay. Um, it may matter by location. I will say location in our neck of the woods is going to be preferring a hidden or hidden configuration of line for clarity purposes. That way it's not ambiguous that it could be something like an architectural feature, something different. So most likely, I'm going to differentiate it with the line type. That's going to be pretty universal, but there is some flexibility in that. Okay. Uh, our preference here would be not to use a solid line. Okay, because again, there's some confusion. That's right, or some other architectural feature. All right. But I definitely wanted to show you the difference now between this nice small dash and a larger dash.
Not necessarily. I'm going to show you where it really takes into account when we actually move to the layout. So I'm going to move to paper space now. Or to layout one. And here is my electrical. I'm going to change my color to be reflective now of something that's easier to see. Oops. I'm trying to grab it like I know what I'm doing. There we go. And in this case, I have quite a bit of space between my dash and the gap. And this is twice the amount of space as this one. Now I might find that that's going to be a little bit unreasonable in terms of the amount of gap that I have. So I'm going to change this to hidden 2. Now notice that nothing really changed, right? Did it change? OK. All right? But definitely more reasonable in terms of its dash spacing. Now let me make sure that I am reflecting a scale for the work at hand. Now this is an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, but it is in fact scaled to a quarter inch equals a foot. So now my notes fell away and I have only my electrical circuit. So your line type and the fact that I have a grouping of hidden lines, that's an acceptable deviation from the standard. That if the hidden line standard is that the dash is x long and the gap between is y, I can create a hidden 2 and a hidden x2 that are acceptable as twice or half of that original. And you'll find that for a lot of line types in CAD. Not just AutoCAD, but it, most CAD tools. Okay. Uh huh. You asked me to look into creating line types, and I spent about four or five hours on YouTube. And there's ways you can create your own. Oh, absolutely. Size, distance, yep. and everything. And yeah. Uh, and every industry is going to likely have some deviation to a line type that's going to be important to the industry, but not necessarily regulated by an agency, okay? So, exactly. So in this case, yeah, could I actually make my own and define the amount of gap and define the amount of dash? I certainly can. And really, it's not all that hard, is it, Jim? No, it takes a little bit, but yeah, you yeah. can add text in between in the spacing. Exactly, yeah. So if I wanted to depict something with a, a P for plumbing or uh, a W for waste or, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I could do that. I could create my own line type. And I really would only want to do that one time. And then I would want to save that in my line types folder, okay, which is essentially another added little file fragment that exists inside your drawing and can be pulled out and put in its own place for future. Okay. I think that's going to that's going to do it for today for continuing with our electrical plan. What's going to happen on Tuesday is that I will uh, most likely call for another status report, just kind of know where you are, a snapshot. And the idea behind it is you will have put a little more time now into floor plan foundation, 
elevations and electrical and it's just a snapshot of where you are. That way I can also give you some feedback if I'm seeing some things that may not quite be what we need to. I still owe you a snapshot feedback from the first one, which I will give you this weekend. So elevations continue on Tuesday? Yes, elevations will continue on Tuesday and I will be starting the roof plan on Tuesday as well. Okay. So it's, as you can kind of see, it's starting to come together. Now after today, how many times do we more do we get together before the final? Six. Six. Okay, six times. So we're running low on time, but we're not running low on effort being applied, and you guys are making very good progress. Okay. So, just say I'm sitting on electrical pretty much done, mm -hmm. and really just elevation. I'm sitting You're on schedule. Okay. You are on schedule, and if you have done some electrical and you've done some elevation work, uh, then you're then you're very close to being on schedule. Okay. If you haven't touched your electrical, haven't touched your elevations, then I would say you might want to think about coming in tomorrow. Okay, Open Lab is going to be available to you guys tomorrow from eight to three. Okay. So got pretty much everything laid out for elevation. Yep. I just need to do kind of do the roof. Okay. All right. And if you want to, you can read Chapter 25 okay. and give you an idea because really the big thing with the roof plan now is knowing your roof pitch, yeah. the type of roof, right? Is it going to be a gable? Is it going to be a hip? And then how do I make that ridge and the valleys work out to the rest of the plan? Okay? All right.